Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's edition of MetalCon Live. Today's very special presentation is being brought to you by both MetalCon Live and the Air Barrier Association of America. The Air Barrier Association of America is proud to present the Air Barriers for Whole Buildings webinar today. Our speaker is Laverne Dalgleish, and Laverne is the president of the association and is heavily involved with air barriers and all buildings, honestly. Now, the Air Barrier Association of America is a fantastic not-for-profit trade association located here in the United States, but they're also all across the remaining portions of the, of the country. Not only are they in Canada and in the U.S., they work across the globe, helping other organizations find their niche and work towards all the benefits of appropriate air barriers. For additional information and understanding of any air barrier processes or gaining quality assurance program or gaining gaining certification through their quality assurance program, please be sure to go to airbarrier.org. We will find all additional information, additional education, and anything else you could imagine about air barriers. I'd also like to announce that coming up in January, on January 10th, we do have another MetalCon Live on the architectural applications for liquid and powder. This session will be presented by PPG and Gary Edgar, who is their architectural manager. So to receive your credits for today, which is an AIA accredited course, or to receive your certificate, all you need to do is fill in the very brief questionnaire at the end of the survey, or at the end of the session. <laughs> That is simply to get your first and last name and additional information so we can send you that certificate of attendance for your accreditations. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Laverne. Laverne, take it away. Thank you. Okay, I have to switch over to the slideshow. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. I'm going to focus today on air barriers and whole buildings and why they're important and, and what would be the benefits and how do we make sure we have a good air barrier installed in our buildings. Go through it. As mentioned, it's AIA accredited. And we're going to talk about what we've done over the last couple of years to improve the quality of air barriers and air barrier testing for whole buildings and so on. So <clears throat> we'll talk about a, a new uh, standard, relatively new standard, the benefits of an airtight building, how we got to where we are today, a training program that we've launched at the universities, a certification program, and then some of the other things that we're working on for the next couple of years. So <clears throat> one of the reasons why we spend so much time in education and site quality assurance is that Air barriers are relatively new in the United States. Uh, when we started the organization in 2001, if I said air barriers, people would have this blank look or people would say, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. That's a vapor barrier. And, and that's still out there, uh, the confusion between what is an air barrier and a vapor barrier. But the, the site quality is really important. Here's a project that the material is good, nothing wrong with the material at all, but the uh, installation, as you can see, is somewhat lacking. It's coming off the building and so on. And then as you look on the inside, you can see a whole bunch of holes. Now, if that material is being installed as a water resistant barrier, uh, it's still not going to um, provide that function, but specifically it's not sealing up all the holes. And that's really what we're after. We want an airtight building. Now, if you're going to have an airtight building, you have to have proper ventilation uh, so that you don't have any health and safety issues. And it can be done. And there's, I can give you thousands of pictures of really nice jobs. Everything's working well. And over the, the years, you can see how buildings perform better for a whole bunch of reasons. An airtight building almost makes everything in the building work better from your insulation in your walls to your mechanical system to everything else that's out there too. So why the big deal? <clears throat> so when we started this back in, in Canada, it was 2019, um, sorry, uh, 19, 1990. Um, 
it was put in because of health and safety, basically moisture management and so on, but it, nobody really cared about it. So there was a, a research project done uh, with the Department of Energy through Oak Ridge National Laboratories and the industry and different buildings were tested. You say Bismarck and, and Minneapolis is sort of up in the cold climates, Miami and Phoenix in the warm climates and St. Louis is sort of in between. And you can see it ranges from, you know, as low as 1.3 up to 2.3. And the one thing uh, you should notice is that as you get warmer, then the buildings become more leakier because it's warm outside. So who really cares? And the number is important because it considered to what we want to do today, uh, the lowest number is 1.3. And we're actually building buildings that are down to 0 0.03 and 0 0.1 is really relatively easy to get. So it just shows how far forward the industry has come in making airtight buildings. So what happens? Well, here's this is now just a 2,500 square foot house, um, and, but the same principle applies to commercial buildings and so on. And we actually did a study. Uh, we were using the lab at Tremco uh, to do air tightness testing, and we wanted to see where the big leaks are. So we started out with an eight foot by eight foot wall that had um, uh, headers and choices and connections to foundations and so on and so forth. And we would seal the leaks up one at a time. And uh, that gave us, um, as we tested them after every time we did sealing, it would, we'd know how much they re reduced and therefore what that leak contributed to the whole leakage of the area there. So you can see there's leaks all over the place. It's pointed out here, uh, you have a half a mile uh, of cracks in a typical 2,500 square foot house. And <clears throat> the other thing, as I mentioned earlier, it impacts uh, insulation. If you're using a fibrous insulation like rock wool or glass fiber or cellulose fiber or whatever, and the air moves through that, you're going to reduce the insulation uh, in that uh, in materials, and it's not going to perform it in the way it should. And up in Minnesota, they've had a requirement for wind washing. Um, in this case, you've got air wind specifically coming from the outside, going into, again, fibrous type of insulation and back out. So it's not technically an air leak in a building, and you know, it's not in air infiltration but it still uh, reduces the uh, efficiency of the insulation. And <clears throat> you can see just a, a simple graph here, uh, what happens to the insulation value if you have an air barrier and without an air barrier, you still have a bit of uh, air leakage and, and uh, fibrous type of insulation, but without an air barrier on the building, you can see it it's really impacts the performance. So one of the things that, we dealt with, um, <clears throat> people wanted to know, you know, what's the impact? Um, and a lot of people uh, associate air barriers with reducing energy cost, which is absolutely true. But when we uh, developed this calculator, um, <clears throat> we had just energy savings and it gave good information. But I was questioning, well, if you can estimate the energy savings of going from a loose building to a tight building, what about moisture? Because that's what causes so many problems in buildings. So I talked to Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the National Institute of Science and Technology, and they said, yeah, since we know the outside um, temperature and we know the inside temperature and we know how much air is leaking, and if we know the temperatures uh, and the relative humidity, we know how much moisture is in the air, it's actually relatively simple. So um, as you can see on the screen, this is now energy savings and moisture transport. So if you go to the calculator on our website and you can see it, uh, if you hit technical information, uh, I'll take you there. You can click use the calculator and you can pick from 52 cities in the United States. We also have five cities in Canada and five cities in China. China happened to be doing a similar project at the same time we were with Oak Ridge and so they're part of it. And the 52 cities were actually specifically chosen so that um, no matter where you are or what city you live in, that one of those cities is going to have very similar uh, conditions, weather conditions as, as uh, where you are. So you would pick one that's close to you. 
and the result that you get would be um, still valid. And you can go into, in this case, uh, the United States and uh, Washington State and the city of Seattle. And we use archetypes, which are the same buildings that are used by the Department of Energy for uh, determining code compliance. <clears throat> and there's, uh, we got out of the 16 archetypes, we have um, 12 of them in, a, in the calculator. So there's secondary schools and high rise and office buildings and so on. This happens to be a mid-rise apartment and it defaults to square footage. You can't change the square footage. You can't really change how the building's built because uh, as soon as you do that, you're gonna change what the um, leakage rates are and so on. And you can do it in liters per second per meter squared, or you can do it in cubic feet per minute uh, per square foot. And you take your base case, whatever it might be, it's going to default to what is normally out there. And in liters per second, it's 6.7. And then you can re re retrofit the building or you can make it airtight down to a half a liter. Uh, it's going to have energy costs that is used by the code people. If you know your energy costs, you can actually change those. And then you simply hit the uh, calculate button that you see there. It's going to produce a report that looks like this. And um, it's going to show uh, the base case, the retrofitted building. And then if you look at the equivalent leakage area, that means if you took all the cracks and everything and you put them in one hole, how big would that hole be? And you can see under base case, you're starting out with about a 13, almost a 13 square foot hole and you're reducing it down to just under one foot. And what does that mean? If you go down to close to the bottom on this particular one, um, you're going to see uh, the, ener the energy savings in this particular case. You're going to save $2,000 a year just simply by having an airtight building. But most importantly, if you go farther down, <clears throat> excuse me, on that, you can see how much water that is going through the building. So you had to start with um, 64 and a half thousands of gallons of water that's going through those holes. Now you could say, well, it's going in one hole and out the other hole. And so that's actually helping to get rid of moisture in a building. Um, but the, anytime that happens in your building envelope, you have the possibility for condensation, whether it's an air conditioning building down in Miami or uh, a heated building up in Bismarck, North Dakota or Fargo or Chicago. They have that possibility. So and having simply just an airtight building, you can reduce how much water is going through the building envelope from uh, 64 and a half thousand gallons down to um, just over 4,800 gallons a year, which means you still got some moisture going through there, but it's severely reduced on there. Uh, the next one I show you here is, um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these. I'm just gonna give you the basics on them, but you can see, um, this is a high rise apartment. And this is again in Washington State in Seattle. You go through the same process and you hit the button and you come down. Now here you started out with 156 and a half, almost thousand gallons a year. Keeping in mind an Olympic swimming pool is about 330,000 gallons. So you got like a half a Olympic swimming pool going through the building. Now to be fair, it's, um, 84,000 uh, square feet of floor space there. Again, you have your, your energy savings and you're reducing 156,000 gallons down to just under 37,000 gallons. And so it's the idea behind it is you wanna reduce the equivalent leakage area. In this case, the base case is almost 26 square feet and you're reducing it down to 1.68 square feet. So you can play around with it, do different things. Here's a secondary school, again, up in Washington. Uh, same type of thing. Now, you have 210,000, almost 211,000 square feet. And you're now saving significant energy costs, almost $32,000. But now you've got 969, almost 900 and, I'm sorry, 690,000 gallons of water. You're reducing that down to just um, over 90, almost 95,000 gallons. So the point is there, in this case, you have almost 138 square feet of leakage and you're able to reduce it down to just under 10 square feet there. 
So just did some comparison. And my first goal here was to show the difference between water vapor going through materials, which is what you would use a vapor barrier or vapor retarder for, and the amount of moisture that goes through holes. And the problem is, is this is, is this is like comparing oranges to Ford 150 trucks. There is no comparison whatsoever. But the point I want to try to make here is the amount of water coming in through the holes in the building compared to how much moisture goes through materials uh, in a building is, is um, magnitude um, difference in there. I was in sort of central western United States talking to design professionals and they were, I was asking, you know, do you have problems with buildings? And they're going, oh yeah, it's moisture problems in buildings are just horrendous here. We're trying to fix them. We got to get better vapor barriers. And I go, well, have you ever considered um, air leakage in buildings creating this problem? And they go, oh no, we can't even look at air leakage. Uh, we got to get this solved with uh, and vapor barriers and making sure we have the right materials and so on. And the problem is, is a lot of the things that show up as liquid water is um, not water coming from the outside and not water going through materials, because that's a very long, slow process. It's actually water uh, that is the condensation of the vapor of, of, the, of the moisture going through there. So here's just... Um, uh, four different places. You got the Seattle, Washington, the San Francisco, Chicago, and Florida, just to give you an idea. You can also see there's a difference in the amount of water between mid-rise and high-rise, and this uh, deals with the um, buoyancy effect of uh, the stack effect. Uh, there's more air leakage uh, because of greater pressure difference if you have a high building and it's in a cold climate. But you can see you know, the difference in there, um, you still got a lot of water going through every, now this is per every square inch of hole. So this is not the whole building. If you look at Seattle, Washington, mid rise, it's just over 5,500. Uh, and then you move over to the high rise and you're up to 18,000 ounces. Um, that's just per square inch of hole. But compare it to um, materials that you would, have for um, a one me uh, about 39 inches by 39 inches piece of drywall or or OSB or whatever it is, you can see that you're down into the one point uh, or 0 0.16, 1.6 and 16. So even a 10 firm piece of material is only going to have two cups of water going through that in a whole year compared to um, thousands of ounces or hundreds of gallons of water that's going through that same hole. Why do we care? <clears throat> well, the picture on the on the right hand side is actually there was five homes in, in Minnesota where they had problems. And if you looked at the house, you would never know there was any, any damage to it. Uh, there's no reason to have damage to it. There was no windows that might have leaked, no pipes that might have uh, leaked and so on. But as you took the cladding off, um, you can see the damage there. And most of the homes of these five homes that were tested and, and properly done ranged from $100,000 to $250,000 to do the repair work. But the kicker was all of these five homes were less than five years old. So <clears throat> everything is out there that can be damaged. You can see the bottom picture is... is um, Again, rotten and mildew in a, in a crawl space. And then the picture in the upper left is uh, hoarfrost. This is inside your attic. So this is warm, moist air that leaks out through the ceiling of your, of your house or your building, goes up into an attic, and it's much colder up there. This picture happened to be up in North Dakota in the wintertime, and it wants to condense on a surface. And in this case, this is the trusses. Now, all that hoarfrost, as we call it, is going to uh, melt as uh, the weather warms up or the sun comes out, even sometimes. It can be really cold outside, but the wind would, or the sun would warm up the shingles and the roofing. This is all going to turn to liquid water and come down into the ceiling. So, in addition to energy and water, if you want a, a, a building that's very quiet, uh, have an air barrier. In fact, there's a lot of work being done in some areas of the United States where 
air barriers are being installed in interior walls. And this is to reduce sound transmission from, let's say your next door neighbor in an apartment building or smells that is coming from their cooking or whatever it is. Um, the one thing that people in an airtight building have said is um, we don't have to do the dusting. Um, but it's not just dust, you can get pollen, you can viruses, you can so on. And <clears throat> the other thing that if you have relatively big holes, and I'm talking about eighth of an inch, three sixteenths of an inch, you can get a lot of insects coming into the building. Good friend of mine, um, his whole business was retrofitting schools and other buildings for air tightness. And a lot of reasons why he was getting contracts for schools was to keep um, flies out of the school because it was very distracting for the students. And if you're in a cold climate and you you got air leakage uh, around your window, because there's the, the rough opening that your window fits in is always bigger than the actual window frame. And if that's not sealed, then you get cold air leaking in and it super cools the frame. The frame is the least performing part of your window. Center glass is the best. And now it's super cool. So I've got pictures where you get hoarfrost again on the inside of, of window frames and so on. And if you have an airtight building, your, your furnace is going to work better. It's going to get air to where it is um, properly and you're going to feel more comfortable. You're not going to feel the drafts that are coming in from infiltration and so on. So let's get to uh, whole building test methods. So a whole building test method, you basically pressurize the building and you can actually measure how much leakage there. That's where we got the numbers that started out um, at the very start of the presentation. And back in the uh, 70s, late 70s and 80s, there was a lot of um, work being done by the Department of Energy to improve the efficiency and reduce the energy used in a lot of homes across the United States. And two test methods were developed back in those days, ASTM E779 and CGSB 14910. And these two were mainly focused on uh, residential homes because that's where all the sort of money was being spent. And <clears throat> they would again go in and do a blower to test and they would do two things. They would determine how leaky it is and what's the potential for retrofit. And then if your building is pressurized, you can also find the leaks there too. That was focused um, a little bit more later on with the ASTM E1827, which is similar to E779, <clears throat> but it's now specifically using a blower door. In 779, you can also use mechanical equipment and other things. Um, so this, the two tests are very, uh, very similar. Now, they really dealt with how do you calculate air leakage and so on and so forth. And CGSB was deemed to be a better standard because it helped you or guided you to how do you prepare the building? Is there a big hole that we called intentional there? Maybe a, a fan or a duct, do you seal that off? Why are you doing the test? What are you trying to determine? And then ABBA worked with the Army Corps of Engineers. They had what was called a protocol. And a protocol is half a test method and half a specification because the test method just says how you do the test and it gives you the number, but it doesn't say, you know, whether that's a good number or bad number. Whereas the Army Corps had uh, very specific numbers. And they started out in, in early 2000 with a maximum air leakage of 0.25 cubic feet per square foot at a pressure difference of 75 pascals. And <clears throat> ABBA updated that for them and worked on that. And then we took that information and we produced an ABBA test method. It was the first test method we developed, ABBA triple, uh, T0001. And it was written in more standard language on there. We then took that um, test method that we had developed uh, for it we took it to ASTM and now it's published as ASTM E3158. And it gets much more into the details of the types of tests and why you would do them. How do you prepare the building? And it also is appropriate for all sizes of building, but um, one thing is that's missing in 779 or 1827 is large or multi-zone buildings. So it's a much more accurate test. We have even done an around Robin the first round robin, uh, there was about a 40% variance, which is huge. And all that information was brought back into 
the development of the test method and we reduced it down to about 10%, which I think is really, really good. So um, if you're using other test methods like E779, uh, those haven't went through a round robin. We don't have um, any sort of accuracy in the test um, on there, but at least we have in 3158. So if you are considering a whole building test, I'd strongly recommend that you put in your requirements that it's done in accordance with ASTM E3158. So here's the protocol that we put together. This is to back, done back in uh, 2012, and it met the needs of the Army Corps. And the Army Corps is responsible uh, through the um, specification, the unified specification for any building that the US government builds, built in the world. So we've actually been involved with uh, various countries. I think it's up to about 12 different countries uh, that the whole ABBA, whole building testing and quality assurance program has been used on those buildings. But as I say, we took the Army Corps, we turned it into the middle one there, which was the ABBA T0001, that was 2016. And then you can see the front page of ASTM 3158 in 2018, what it is. It's now up for every five years, we have to update the standard. So we're working on that and we can actually uh, have seen some improvements we can make on that one too. So it's gonna be very accurate on there. Now, as I've traveled all over the United States and I've talked to code officials and, and uh, program people, even uh, building owners and design professionals, I've always got two questions asked. Number one, do, how do I know this person can do a proper test? Because if they don't know what they're doing, they could say your building fails if there's a requirement and maybe you didn't. Accuracy becomes really, really important uh, for doing this test. And the other question I always got asked is, do we have enough people? So based on those two things, uh, App has put together a training program and a certification program. So you can see, um, on the, on the left-hand side, there's a copy of the manual there. We launched it in January 2022. It's five days of training, includes high uh, hands-on. So far, we've been delivering it with South Seattle Community College in Seattle, Washington. And in 2024, we're going to be setting up, we hope, um, anywhere between three and five locations all over the United States. We definitely need one on the East Coast and you know on down South and so on. Responses we're getting from the people who have gone through the training uh, has been very, very positive. We actually have our next course starting on Monday and we will be uh, scheduling courses in 2024. So if anybody's interested in attending the course, um, we will have those dates uh, shortly on our calendar. And in the five days, you basically spend a couple of days on the theory side. You spend uh, a couple of days in mock-ups. We have two small houses, if you want to think of them that way, where you go out and you play with the equipment and you learn how to use it. And you can see the difference if something happens. And then we actually test the whole building, um, just like if you were going out on the job site and doing that. It's a building we're able to use at South Seattle Community College. Here's just an overview. You can see we do the introduction, we do the air leakage overview, we go through the equipment. We have both blower door manufacturers participating because some of the questions is very specific to either the equipment from that manufacturer or from, uh, or the software. So both Retrotech and TEC uh, provide um, people they attend the course and they're able to answer all the questions. The other thing in, in any face-to-face -face training is you get to listen to the problems and, and sort of learning experience of the people sitting around you and so on. <clears throat> and I think that's just as important as actually listening to the instructor. Uh, Denali Jones is our instructor right now. And then um, you can sort of put all those things together. So you can see in day two and day three, um, day one is just the overview. Day two, you're getting into some of the factors. Uh, they do actually a bit of a mock-up. It's a small tent that you can make airtight and play with the equipment. And then day three, you're getting into actually doing a test, but the test would be done on a mock-up. 
And in day four, you carry you can carry that on. And in day five, you set up and you test a whole building just like you would if you were hired to do that. Here's an example uh, of our mock-ups. It's a you know basically a cube tying a thing with a wall separating the slider window that you can sort of see peeking in there is designed to we uh, we can open and make the hole bigger or smaller operator to windows and so on. There's a ceiling or a roof on this uh, because we need NF4, we need this airtight or relatively airtight to be able to um, use the equipment on it. But <clears throat> training without certification, um, a lot of training is done where you get what is called a certificate. And some people uh, call that a certificate for a warm seat and a chair. And if you if you don't confirm the knowledge, skills, and abilities of the person going to a training course, you really don't know whether how much they've learned and if they've learned everything. So when you're developing training and certification, <clears throat> both of them you start out with uh, defining what the job is. And so we do it what is called a task analysis, see what the jobs are. And from that task analysis, we develop a function and task listing. And the functions are sort of general headings. And then the task is everything, every step that you have to do from starting to plan the, the test to writing up the final um, report on that. Now, ABBA uses the certification that it, uh, we're accredited to ISO 17024. So if you ever wanna know <clears throat> about the certification, because there's a lot of stuff out there. People give out certificates for attending. Sometimes there's one um, conference I attend in Massachusetts. You get the certificate of attendance as you walk in the door and register. <clears throat> so it really doesn't mean anything. And even people that claim to do proper certification, they have their own rules, which um, can bring in bias and so on. We follow the very strict standards of 17024, which includes treating everybody exactly the same. Uh, you have a very specific way of doing questions for determining the knowledge and the skills, a uh, very specific way of doing um, practical exams and so on. So wherever you go for your, your training, make sure that they offer certification and that their certification is accredited by somebody like ANSI, American National Standards Institute, to the ISO 17024 standard. So, and when you're looking at certification and you're looking at training, it's divided into knowledge, skills, and ability. And if you look these um, terms up in the, in the dictionary, there's a lot of cross there. And a lot of people say skills and abilities and knowledge is the same thing. But scholarly, uh, uh, the easy way to um, sort of separate the two out is how you do the test. So the knowledge part, we confirm by a, a test, a question, a written question. Now that written question can't be misleading. It can't be yes or no. It can't be long answer because then we're not treating everybody the same. So every question is multiple choice. So there's one right answer and three wrong answers. And as I say, they can't be misleading or trick questions or anything. Skills is still done <clears throat> on paper or on a computer. All our exams are computerized. But now you have to do something. You maybe you have to calculate the volume of the building so and estimate the air leakage so you know how many fans to do there. But it's it's basically problem solving, but problem solving here on paper. And in abilities, you actually have to do something. So an ability test, um, as we do offer ability test, <clears throat> and you would have to go out and actually um, lower door test the whole building. And you're watched during that whole thing. And the person watching you and evaluating you basically can't encourage you, can't give you suggestions, has basically got to shut up the whole time that that person is, is watching you or watching the, the student on there, and then you're graded, and there's a list of things that, that you're graded on. And then as a, I've already talked about the certificate program versus certification, and there is a, an error money that came out 
a few years ago, there was, uh, I believe, a close to a billion dollars spent on training, a whole bunch of stuff. And the evaluation of those is that the training, uh, basically, in most cases, well, I shouldn't say most cases, a lot of cases was a waste of money. The people coming uh, out of the training course, because it wasn't really proper training, didn't know anything more than they came into. So some government agencies, if they're going to support training in any way, unless there's a certification in accordance with 17024, they won't um, allow um, any funds to go towards that. So it, they want to make sure that their money is well spent. And you as a person, if you're going to invest in training, you want to make sure that it's there too. <clears throat> so again, getting back to the question of... Uh, the two questions I'm always asked, how do I know the person conducting the test is qualified? If they're credited by ABBA or any other organization that is doing it in accordance with 17024, then you know that that person has a qualification there. <clears throat> and you can see here, basically 17024 is conformity assessment, general requirements for bodies operating certification of persons. Now, um, that means this standard can be applied to any type of training and certification. Welders, for example, a lot of the certification bodies are um, for welders that uh, are following 17024. Um, nurses follow 17024 and so on. And in addition to the rules, because that's what this standard says you have to do, is um, you have to develop a certification scheme. What are you looking for? What is, uh, what is the requirements for people coming in to be certified? What do they have to do to be certified? And what, at what time could they lose their certification? And so we worked with uh, people in Washington State. We had an ad hoc group. Uh, they included blower door manufacturers, people that have done testings, people that want to do testings, people from the code agencies and so on. And we actually met for almost two years, just going through everything, getting it all sorted out. And I believe the result is we've developed a really good training program and certification. And I want to express my thanks because that was, we were meeting every week. So that's a tremendous amount of time, volunteer time that people put in just to make sure this, this program meets the needs of the industry talked about this already. Knowledge is confirmed by multiple choice. Skills is problem solving on a written test. ability is you are proctored and it can be on a mock-up or it can be on a building. Uh, the one problem with buildings is that going back to the requirements, you have to treat everybody the same. We can't have, proctor somebody on a really simple building and proctor, uh, proctor another person in a really complicated building. So that's been one of the challenges is to find buildings that are sort of not too simple and not too complex. And if we set up these other locations in the United States, we need a building that's kind of the same as what we're using in Washington State there. So, but it's all the work of getting things set up and getting things organized is worthwhile. So <clears throat> going back to the requirements in uh, 17024 is confidentiality which means that we uh, all the key or all the test questions are under lock and key, if you want to look at it that way. Anybody that participates in developing the questions uh, are under a confidentiality agreement. Um, people that are going to do training are not allowed to develop the questions because we don't want people teaching to the test, which happens in the industry a lot. Uh, and so on. And then in the normal confidentiality of uh, we don't go give out any information of anybody we're, that has been certified other than they are certified. And then the impartiality. And it, and it sounds like it's pretty easy to do, but I worked with an organization up in New York that was doing retrofits for under uh, government programs and utility programs. And they were doing houses, retrofitted houses. And so part of it was to do a blow door test. And so we started out the in the organization going, well, let's find homes. Like nothing is better in training to, to find a home and do a test. When we got in and they, I worked with them so that they are accredited to 17024. And as we got into the impartiality, 
we realized that it was almost impossible to find homes that are exactly the same. There's uh, even they look the same and they may be the same size. The heating system may be different. The um, how they're built could be different and so on. So we actually had to switch to mock-ups so that everybody could be treated exactly the same. And again, that, that makes it fair and even a playing field for everybody out there. Um, and we, we have a number of questions in the question bank, so they are always um, re um, revolved sort of on there. We have to do a um, analysis um, on the questions, we have to determine how many people got them right, how many people got them wrong. If you got them wrong, how many people got this wrong answer versus that wrong answer. And so this psychometric analysis that we do on an ongoing basis helps us to keep on improving the questions and we can weed out questions that are not appropriate or, or, or maybe need to be improvement in the writing and so on. So it's constant improvement at all those. So what are we talking about with site air leakage testing? Well, <clears throat> here's an example, a couple of blower doors. And I have to say, I've been involved in this industry in, uh, since the you know, mid eighties. And in those days, blower doors were relatively primitive. In theory, they haven't really changed, but uh, the blower door manufacturers have really simplified them. We went from the one pitch you see in the middle, a single fan for every door, and they're called blow, blow, um, door blower doors because typically you would fit them in with that fabric into a frame and it fits in a door. That's specifically what it's for. But now you can get up to three fans and the uh, CFM in each fan so have now greatly improved. Um, the software that comes with the blower doors do all these calculations that you used to have to do by hand and do R squared analysis of them and so on and so forth. Everything is in the palm of your hand. So they've really improved what's being done. So two things happened is we are building the buildings tighter now. And with the improvements in fan, there is no building that is too big to be tested. The biggest building I've been involved in was in Jamaica, New York, it was a million square feet, 12 stories high, covered a whole city block. It was a government building, and we spent the weekend on doing the blur dirt test because there were so many problems with the building that was associated with air leakage, but the owner, which was a government agent, really didn't want to spend the money to fix it properly. So we did the test, uh, we got approval to do the test just to show how leaky it was. Um, this is actually the building itself. Uh, on there. And when I heard Jamaica, I put my hand up going, I want to go there. And then when a plane landed, I realized it's Jamaica, New York. Bit of a disappointment, but it was a really cool place to sort of go in. Here's some of the setups. Um, <clears throat> you use either Wi-Fi or Cat5, Cat6 cable now. The picture on the right-hand side is all the manometers and so on. Picture in the center, most of the blower doors, there's 33 fans in it were put in um, um, appar an apparatus that was built in the loading dock because we were able to open the big doors and put them all in. But we did have like the picture on the left-hand side in different entrances there too. <clears throat> this is things being set up. You can see the covers for the fans are, are billowing. And that's because even with, with nothing on in the building, we had a uh, pressure difference at this point about 35 pascals. There's just another part. We had some, uh, some of the fans up on the roof deck and so on. And that's a good thing to do. We, if you can distribute the fans throughout the building so we have more equalized pressure. Uh, but we also opened up all the elevators and so on. So we had good communication of, uh, of the airflow all through the building. There's <clears throat> pictures of mon manometers. A lot of people think that the pressure difference in a typical building is around six pascals. You can see, you know, the average, you got 29 pascals and 30 pascals and so on. And that's without anything running. That was a building just being uh, affected by the wind and the temperature outside. Good thing about uh, building being big, so big is we didn't have to go on the outside of the building. This is sealing off a ductwork. We call that an intentional opening. And we could do it inside the building behind the, the louvers are out there. And you can see that the ductwork is about six feet in diameter. That's the person putting it on. 
picture on the right is uh, the different elevators and the doors are all open so the air will flow from one floor to another floor. And of course the safety precautions that is mandatory to do it. You seal everything off on the roof because we don't want to, the purpose of this test wasn't to, to um, include how leaky the mechanical system was. It was to deal with the building envelope only. That's where all the problems were coming from. Now, this is a more typical building you see across the United States. As I've worked with the codes, they've indicated that 50% um, of our buildings across the United States are three stories and less. This actually happens to be four stories, but it's on there. We did this a number of years ago. This is in South Korea, and this is what we call a um, blower door rodeo. And so this is a building we went into and we invited architects and building owners and we had the chief architects from the Army Corps of Engineers come and it was to educate them on what actually happens in the blower door. And so we did the PowerPoint presentation show the reason why we looked, took them through the building. <clears throat> we They watched the setup of the blower doors and then uh, we put the the, uh, the output of the uh, computer on a screen large enough so everybody could watch it and so on. And then we walked them through the building uh, with chemical smoke, um, looking for air leakage and they were able to see it. We also asked everybody to, uh, out of the four floors to guess on which floor was the leakiest. And the second floor, which was basically a cafeteria with cooking equipment and ductwork and so on, everybody sort of chose that one and they chose, they, they said the top story was the tightest because it was basically a big room, not a lot of interior partitions and so on. And it was actually completely wrong. The most leakiest floor in this building was a top floor because a lot of times we're still not putting air barriers into roofs. We expect the roofing material, although it can shed water, it may not be airtight. And so, and yet we were really surprised at how tight the floor with the cafeteria was on. And as we looked at how they ran the ductwork and so on, they had done a really, really good job. The picture up in the top on the right-hand side is showing the, the pressure difference. And then we shut down the blower doors and you can see the big drop there. So blower door rodeos um, is a fantastic way of, of helping people understand how easy it is. During one of our training courses, one of the reps from the um, from TEC, I believe it was, had to go or was asked to go with one of his customers to uh, oversee a test of the building and help out. And they went into an existing building. It was six, I believe six stories high. People were in the building, but the uh, blower door contractor was so set up with everything he did they were in and out of that building in two hours. And they had their truck just perfect so they could, um, they didn't set up the blower doors. So all the frames were already together. So they just took them out of the out of the truck and put them in the door. They had the, the fabric around them. They then stuck the, it, it was just down. It was so nice to see. And they had everything just properly done, properly placed. And again, the time, um, needed to conduct the, the test was very, very minimal. Okay. So how do you find the leaks? Well, you got to be able to see them. You can't see, you can't see um, air leaks at all. So you got to make them visible. So the picture on the left-hand side is actually the building I just showed you. That's in Jamaica, New York. He has uh, what is sometimes called a smoke gun. Uh, it's a, a material that um, basically you put in a puffer. Uh, they have more sophisticated ones out there now that uh, produce something that you can see. And then if you've got a big building, you can actually switch over to a fog machine. This is the same as, as uh, you would have for theatrical fog. Kind of cool uh, piece of equipment. And if you get the chance to bring it home, you know, if you have children and they have a children party, you can make fog for the party. Kind of really cool. But you got you can't see the leaks, leaks so you've got to make them visible there. Again, this is a parapet. Uh, this is the ceiling or the floor below, and you can just see how much air is coming up through that parapet there. Just some more pictures. 
Um, and you can do whole buildings, although one thing I would recommend, if you're gonna do a whole building test, you wanna contact the fire department in that area because as your neighbors see all this smoke billowing out of your buildings, they're gonna believe that the, the building is on fire and they're gonna phone the fire department. And when they come and realize that you're just conducting the test, trust me, they have no sense of humor what's, whatsoever. Um, it's, and it's also, to be fair to them, it's a waste of their time and money uh, to respond to something that is not a fire. So be, uh, be cognizant of that and you know let people know even the people around you. Now, here you can see smoke billowing out, you know, it got a leak, but this is now the brick veneer on there. And so that becomes harder to find. So a lot of times, if you can test a whole building before the outside, yeah, the veneer is put on, it's to do it. But we can test all existing buildings. And that's, that's actually where the major savings and reduction in greenhouse gases and carbons and so on can be made is in our existing buildings because the number of buildings we build each year is only a small fraction compared to how many already exist. Also, we can use thermography. Thermography is um, infrared. You can see difference in temperatures. So you can see, you can use all different equipment. It can be very sophisticated. I actually have one that I put on my iPhone. Now, it's not precise as a $250,000 piece of equipment, but it works pretty cool. And it does what I need it for. I just want to know the temperature difference between the two of them. So there's a picture at the top. There's a, um, looks like a, a window or a patio door on there. And, you know, it looks pretty good. Now, if you do an infrared, and especially if you have a something that will, will draw air into the building, this is a cold climate. So with a blower door running, um, you can, you'll suck air into the building. And if you take a picture before you start the blur door and a picture after, you know this is air. Uh, one of the problems with, with uh, thermography is, is it also shows up if you have wet insulation or if you have thermal bridging and so on, and you're looking for air leakage. So take a picture before you turn on the blower door, depressurize the room, take another picture, and you're gonna see what you see at the bottom there. And now you, gotta, you can go and find, find the leaks and again, positive pressure on the right-hand side, so all the warm air is going out. So you can see sort of the bottom uh, left, left-hand corner, it's, it's brighter, that's your hot air going out. And then this is cold climate, so we put on negative pressure, we're sucking cold air from the outside. Again, very visual, and you need to be visual, whether it's the thermography, smoke, or whatever else that's out there. This was the example I talked about earlier in a cold climate with a window. This happens to be a, a door and window combination. You can see the frost building up on the on the a jam there. Now, and the hoar frost all around there. Now, be, to be fair, it's really cold outside, relatively humid inside. We like our relative humidity between 35 and 50 percent, uh, and that's what happens. But we use really really sophisticated tools to determine where the hole is. It's called a hand. And if you can put your hand between uh, a door or window and the rough opening, you've got a hole. You don't have to use anything else out there. So a hole like that was super cooling the frame. Once that was sealed off, and if you can get some insulation in there, like using this, um, a sealant foam um, is very good. One component or two component, that type but you're not gonna get a lot of insulation value there, but the key is to stop the air leakage. And again, somebody had a smart aleck idea, no smoking permitted when we were doing testing on windows. And you can see if air is coming through these windows, water is gonna come through too. So support programs that we're moving started in 22, uh, we're also working on somebody that uh, we can train and certify for finding and fixing the leaks, the thermography. There's a lot of information out about thermography and it's used for multiple things. It's very light in building envelope. You know, how do we determine um, moisture and insulation versus air leaks and so on. So we'll continue to add to this as another tool that we can have out there for the industry use. 
And our whole goal is we, we all as a nation need to move to high performance building. You can call it carbon free, you can call it low greenhouse gas emissions, you can call it um, net zero, uh, but we do need to reduce the energy use of buildings and we need to improve the part, performance and most important, the life uh, of that building. I've heard before and I sort of agree with it, the greenest building we can ever build is uh, a greenest building we can ever have is a building we don't have to build. And what was meant by that is we have the opportunity to improve all our existing buildings. Air leakage control or sealing up all the holes in the building is the least costly and best return in everything that we do, but we need to go beyond that with extra insulation and other improvements. Our buildings are becoming more sophisticated, whereas people are becoming more demanding. We don't like to be too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry. And so we, a lot of times, count on our mechanical system to, to give us heat, give us cooling, whatever it might be. And we're sort of missing the fact that let's make sure that the building's built right and it performs right. And then it makes it really easy for the mechanical system to make the environment that we live in um, as comfortable as possible. And that covers our program for today. Is there <clears throat> any questions that anybody would like to answer? We have a couple of minutes yet. Um, I only have one question that has come through for you. And that question is, do you have a water and air barrier boot? both do you have a water and air barrier both in your wall and roof design or are there any products that are both yes it's a short answer and uh, most air barrier materials are also water resistant barrier materials with some exceptions like um, osb and drywall and so on but most of your fluid applied and your self-adhered uh, membranes that are out there even your cellular plastic as long as it's low cells will, can be your air and water resistant barriers. So number one, lots of materials, go to our website. You're gonna see materials that are air barrier materials, materials that are only water resistant barriers, which means maybe they're a house wrap that's punctured with a bunch of holes. It'll shed the water, but it's it leaks air. <clears throat> and then you'll see air and water resistant barriers out there. That's the first step is use a material that's both but then you have to install it properly. You probably got an air barrier material on your building already. You probably have a water resistant barrier material already on your building. But if you haven't designed and constructed the building to provide that control layer, then it's not gonna work. And I'll give a good example is house wrap or building wrap. <laughs> it was originally designed to be a water resistant barrier. So you hang it on your building, you overlap it, you do all these things, it's gonna shed water. Now, most of the house wrap or building wrap that's on the market now, the manufacturers have tightened it up so they can also be an air barrier. They meet the maximum air leakage. Now, your installation of that house wrap, instead of just making pinning it up and the least amount of holes through it because you don't want water to go through, now it has to withstand pressure differences. <clears throat> so on the same website for the manufacturer, they're going to have two installation requirements and your installation requirements for a air and water resistant barrier are completely different. You need to use plastic headed, two inch diameter plastic headed nails. You have to have typically a 16 inch by 12 inch um, nailing pattern. You gotta seal all the joints. You can't just overlap them and so on and so forth. And even in that case, sometimes um, you haven't done enough and you gotta do more. We see this in testing. Um, and that's a very simple one, but it also applies to everything that you have. If it's a water resistant barrier, you need to include flashing as part of it. And as your air barrier, you need to make sure that there's no holes, there's no places that you're missed. Uh, you've overlapped the material, you've sealed it to your penetrations and terminations. And if you're sealing it to a window, let's say a metal frame, aluminum frame window, that window is going to expand and contract with temperature changes. So what we call a transition membrane to go from, let's say, your wall to your window, that has to be flexible. All those things have to be done to make it an air and water resistant barrier. But most air barrier materials are air and water resistant barriers. You just have to install them the same. 
And that's my email address. And feel free to, if anybody has any questions that comes up in the future, uh, reach out to me. I'll do my best to help you. Awesome. Do you have time for just a few quick questions, Laverne? We sure. do have a few that have come through. Uh, so do you suggest testing before veneers are installed? Is that the best time to do the test or any other suggestions on timing? Yeah, sequencing is a big issue because sometimes uh, if you're working on a tall building, they are topping it off and building floors at the same time. The cladding's being put on the first few floors. But yes, if you can test the building before your cladding goes on, uh, it's much easier to uh, correct any, any leakage because uh, everything's nice and wide open. However, um, any leak can be sealed. It just takes a little bit more time and effort, even if the cladding system's on. But yes, if you can test it before the cladding system goes on, that's the time to do it. Perfect. The, the key there is is your air barrier has to be finished. You know, if there's no if there's no windows put in the window openings, it's kind of hard to make your your building airtight. <laughs> Very true. Um, and this is going to be our final question for today is should installation at exterior walls be mineral fiber and not fiberglass? It really depends what you want. They're, they're two different materials. They're both fibrous materials. Uh, mineral fiber um, a lot of times is used in non-combustion construction where glass fiber can't be used in that application. You're going to see that the R value or the U value, depending on which ones that you use, are going to be relatively similar. And the reason for that, and this applies to any uh, fibrous type of insulin, including cellulose, is uh, those materials, whether it's glass or rock uh, or slag that's put in, the biggest thing that they do is they trap air. So air in itself is actually a good insulator. Glass, if you look at it, or even rock is a poor insulator. But when they spin them into cotton candy, for, for argument's sake, and they put them between the studs, and that stops that convection current that can really reduce um, or improve or reduce the amount of energy that's going through that. So it really depends on, on what you want. Uh, they're going to perform relatively the same for thermal insulation, a little bit different for fire. Uh, but in most cases, if you're putting in the wall, you're not necessarily worried about either of those in, especially in residential homes. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for answering all of those questions. Thank you, everyone, for attending today. A huge thank you to the ABAA for their continued partnership on several of our Metal Con Lives. Uh, we hope you'll join us again in 2024. Can't believe it's here already, but January 10th of 2024, please join us for that Metal Con Live. And again, a huge, huge thank you to Laverne for joining us today. Laverne, thank you. Everyone else have a fantastic holiday season. We look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great one. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody.